so in just about a minute, we will be getting started. We're just starting up the live stream, so it's rolling. Tuesday Black. I'm the Court Monitoring Project Specialist, and I'm with Mad Colorado. Hi, I'm Rebecca Green. I'm the Development Director for Mad Colorado. Hi there, I'm Courtney Mathis with Cannabis Doing Good. We're an education and consulting platform that supports the cannabis industry in the endeavor to do racial equity, sustainability, and community benefit. So, uh, Peter Marcus with Terrapin. Uh, we're a multi-state cannabis company based out of Boulder, Colorado. Good morning. My name is Carla Rodriguez, and I am the Corporate Social Responsibility Director for Wanna Brands, which is an edible company based out of Boulder, Colorado. My name is Liz Zukowski. I'm the Policy and Public Affairs Manager for Native Roots Cannabis Company. We're a vertically inter integrated operator with 20 retail locations across the state. Good morning. I'm Fran Lanzer. I'm the Executive Director for Mad Colorado. Hello. My name is Polly Small. I'm I'm Naomi Coons Olver, and I am here to talk about my time with Peter Marcus, also known as Tim. <laughs> Hi, Juliet Tones, Victim Services with Mad Colorado. Good morning. My name is uh, Alan Ma. I'm a sergeant with the Denver Police Department DUIDRE unit. So we have a big group. Thank you guys for joining us today, and I want to open the conversation to Fran from Mad to talk about. Um, some of the folks who have been affected um, with drug and polyuse substance um, yeah, crashes. And Fran, before you begin, we are having a hard time hearing on the other side, so when Fran said presentation voice, just a little louder. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, thank you, Shauna. few months ago about bringing this all together. I'm really grateful to CDOT uh, and to all of our, our partners from the cannabis industry who are joining us here today. And thank you to Sergeant Ma for getting the call like yesterday and being here uh, so you can share your experience with us as well. Um, and of course, Polly, Naomi, thank you uh, for being here and, and having the, the courage to, to share your story because I know that's never easy. So thank you. Um, from Mad's perspective, we have been doing uh, public awareness campaigns actually with Native Roots since 2016. Uh, this year is a little different because 2021 was one of the deadliest years on our roads uh, in the history of Colorado, and we know that we need to do more. Uh, so uh, this year we really wanted to bring together a lot of stakeholders, uh, and we wanted to um, have a conversation about what more we can do. So kind of talk about the state of things, where we're at, what's new, uh, and then talk about what more we can do as well. Because it comes back to, you know, for us, uh, working with victim survivors uh, to save lives and prevent injuries on our roads 
make sure that uh, what has happened to um, Polly <coughs> and Naomi's families and to hundreds of families across Colorado, we want to stop that from happening. We know that um, whether we're talking about alcohol or cannabis or other types of drugs, uh, impaired driving is always 100% preventable. So we want to get to that point. And so I'm grateful for all of you uh, for being here. Um, and uh, actually, Skylar from AAA, you got the, the invite last minute too. So really appreciate you being here too. Um, and so uh, for us with MAD, we do want to ground what we're doing uh, in uh, you know, the reality of the, the victim survivor experience. And so uh, we have asked uh, Naomi and Polly uh, to share their stories uh, with us. And then as we move forward, we can you know, keep that in mind to remember that you know, when we talk about 255 people being killed by suspected impaired drivers on our roads last year, uh, each one of them is someone uh, with loved ones, with family, with friends who miss them very much. So uh, we want to begin by um, sharing those stories. So, um, Paula, would you feel comfortable? Would you want to start first? Sure. family and I are, are deeply grateful to MAD for the support that we continue to receive as victims and survivors. And today I appreciate the opportunity to awaken a sense of responsibility and compassion for all human lives by telling you the story of my son Ethan. Ethan had driven into the downtown Denver area early in the morning of January 19, 2019. He went for a run on the Cherry Creek Path running was one of his passions and he worked that in whenever he could and then he went to his side job of uh, driving for a ride share company it was a clear beautiful winter day and it was the morning of the woman's march but that day our world went dark <clears throat> we received a phone call that no parent ever imagines will happen to them it was Denver Health calling to notify us that we needed to get there immediately because our son was involved in a serious automobile crash. We found out later that Ethan had dropped off a passenger and uh, was then proceeding through the intersection at Colfax and Osage on a green light when his car was struck at over 90 miles per hour by a drunk and drugged driver who did not even break. You can only imagine the force of the impact. Ethan's car rolled multiple times, and our precious son, who was just 28 years old, did not survive the violent injuries that he sustained. The driver who killed our son was a multiple DUI offender, driving with a suspended license, and had numerous substances in his system, including THC. <coughs> My husband Howard and I are so proud of the person that Ethan was. He was a joyful, sweet boy who quietly grew into a wise and idealistic young man. He was loving and kind, full of caring and insights. He wanted to make the world a more loving and compassionate place through his writing. He inspired others through his blog to be healthy, to love life, and also to accept its challenges. Ethan had hopes and dreams for his future. He wrote mission statements for himself. One at the top of his list was to share life wisdom with other people who benefit in positive ways, thereby making the world a better place. Ethan's voice was silenced, silenced by a horrific and 100% preventable crime. And you have a choice to separate using legal drugs like alcohol and cannabis and the act of driving. There are so many options available, such as ride share services, designated driver, taxis, public transportation. Um, you can ask for a friend or family to come pick you up. You can stay put if you're at a friend's home. Take the responsibility to make a plan in advance using one of these many options that are available, and I'd love to talk about others if they are out there, because the alternative could possibly be far more costly to yourself 
had the more people in the community. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you, Holly. Mm -hmm. um, Lynn, would you like to tell us about Sun? Yes. Um, bear with me. First time speaking other than Sun Tzu. Um, so, <laughs> as you can see, it's a little bit hard. I'm trying to try and focus on myself because I'm really just preparing myself when I'm in the emotions. Um, so, I'm the only teen solver. I am the mother of entrepreneurs and teachers, um, also known as you know the difference. And what so means to me is he was born dead or dead to me from ninety five. He weighed five pounds four ounces, tiny little thing. But he grew up to be biggest heart. He loved more than anything and all everybody. He was always a smiling face, a loving person. He had lots of friends who still call and talk to me. So thankful for that. Um, but the biggest thing is family. The oldest of nine um, and we all a uh, son just turned 10 on March 2nd. Um, so he has to live with that as well. And asked a lot of questions. the trip with some friends who were sleeping in the back seat. Um, they said he died instantly from my trauma. And he had pretty much up to 10 years of weight left because it was that tough. Uh, of course, my marker on 68 and it's five and he's only a sweet tuck. Um, sweet, mellow, Many don't know me, and he was very too harsh, rough. It was a car and a SUV. No, a truck, sorry. A white truck. Struck head on 60 miles an hour. He said it might have been a flick of the eye, but he had no reason to be so strong. So my son never was. Thank you all for letting me speak. Sorry I couldn't hold myself together. I said it on the <laughs> Thank you. And I hope I spoke loud enough. I'm sorry I crackled a lot. So. Holly, Naomi, thank you so much for sharing this really heartwarming and heartbreaking stories. What we really hope today is just one person more than one person takes this with them and, and determines a plan for 420. But what I want to talk about right now is, you know, over the past couple of years, we've dealt, dealt with a pandemic and a lot of folks thought, oh, cars are not on the road. But really, what is the state of our roads today? And I'd like to, you know, um, uh, open it up to, to, to Lynn, 
um, or to, to, to plan to kind of uh, discuss, as well as perhaps Sergeant Ma kind of giving some insight on what, um, what's happening right now. They're still having some audio issues, so as loud as you can be. Okay. Um, well, so to begin, you know, way back in spring of 2020, when there was starting to be stay-at-home orders, et cetera, we thought maybe, maybe one silver lining would be that maybe our roads would be safer. And instead, the exact opposite has happened. So uh, traffic fatalities are way up, suspected um, impaired driving fatalities are way up. Uh, we went from uh, 176 lives taken on our roads by suspected impaired drivers in uh, 2019 to 255 taken on our roads last year. Um, so uh, for us, we see a lot of things going in the wrong direction. And so uh, we are we're very much committed to working together to find solutions to, to try and turn things around. Uh, because prior to that, we had, we had done a lot of work and things were starting to maybe trend in the right direction. We were seeing some reductions, uh, and now we see things going in the wrong way. And again, uh, I know as, as Glenn always says at our Colorado Task Force on Drunk and Impaired Driving, when we say 255, it's not just a number. It's each one of those is an individual uh, with family and friends, uh, like Naomi and Polly. We miss them very much. So um, for us, we're going to keep driving forward, and that means trying some new things, too. Thanks, Fran. Um, and as a representative to see that, I would. I think our roads are in good shape, but it's our roadway behaviors that, that are challenging. Um, last year, 693 people died in Colorado roadways. That's 58 a month. That, that is a huge number. And that doesn't even include the serious bodily injury and the effects it has. Um, Naomi and Paul, I'm sorry for what you went through. I appreciate hearing your stories. Um, at our task force, we never want to just, those are just numbers, those are, those are numbers of people. Where 30% of our impaired driving fatalities are alcohol related, that, that's just absurd to me. And for the type of cars that we drive in the state and the type of roadways, the numbers are just way too high. And it's ironic because the behavior is one thing that could, that could be changed. So um, I think the roads are good to travel on, but it all depends on people doing the right thing. And we've seen from our numbers, we have a lot of people not doing the right thing, and the ripple of effect is disappointing. Sergeant Ma? Um, well, first, thank you for uh, having me here today. And uh, uh, Polly, your son's um, the uh, case, our unit was actually uh, uh, actively involved in um, the uh, June Day investigation case, and uh, so sorry for your loss, and Madam, so sorry for your loss as well. Um, the, uh, since 2019, not only the um, uh, impaired driving um, continued to be one of the issues that we deal with, the uh, uh, Trend Traffic Operations Bureau uh, with the Denver Police Department. And um, um, with cannabis uh, being one of the contributing factors to people's impairment, and what we see is a varying of speeds and uh, high speed driving. And um, uh, with a higher speed of uh, vehicles traveling, uh, the crashes are higher energy, involving higher energy. And as a result, people are likely to suffer more severe injuries as well. And uh, if you all have noticed, uh, during the past uh, two years, one thing that we start to see more and more, uh, more occurrences on the streets, especially on weekends, is uh, street racing. And uh, with the street racing, uh, many of the drivers choose or chose to be intoxicated or under the influence of other substances while driving. And uh, the, uh, some of uh, our officers are um, committed to identifying and remove these um, high-risk drivers and um, as to cannabis and the other drugs um, as well. Um, the, uh, we continue to see that uh, being a constant uh, uh, issue for public safety and the roadway safety. Can I just add something else? I would just say to echo what Fran said, we've, we've done research on triple A's. Why did fatalities increase during the pandemic? And it's exactly Everybody else who's driving went down, except for the riskiest drivers out there, young male drivers. They actually drove more. Uh, combine that with the fact that the number one thing that slows traffic down is traffic. You have very risky drivers on the road making risky choices at high speeds because there's just not that delimiting factor. 
So what, as traffic safety people, can we control? Well, that behavior, right? And it is, of course, speed and, of course, impairment, but fundamentally, and, and we hear from the heads of state patrol on this all the time, the, the scourge on our roads is not any individual behavior. It is we have a selfish driving problem. If you choose to speed, that's a selfish choice, right? If you choose to drive impaired, it's a selfish choice. That's what we have to address, is how do we think, and we got really good in the pandemic of doing this. How do we think about us as a collective? We just now need to apply that to our behavior on our roads. Thank you, Skyler. Um, well, very you know unique partnership between um, MAD and the government um, agencies in the cannabis industry here in Colorado. Liz, um, from Native Roots, what is the cannabis industry doing to partner and raise awareness? So we know that this is a really important conversation to have with the cannabis industry. And around 420, we see our sales increase about 48% in the days leading up to the holiday. So we know that people are consuming, we know that they're trying, they want to celebrate. And we see this as an opportunity to encourage our customers to plan ahead and not drive impaired. Um, that's part of reinforcing our responsible consumption message that we share um, 365 days a year. And um, you're gonna see specific language like on these signs, celebrate 420 by taking the high road um, on digital displays in our dispensaries and also across our social media platforms. And Peter, you're with Terrapin, another uh, dispensary brand here in Colorado. Anything you'd like to add about what, what you're doing and what this partnership means? Sure. Well, first of all, Naomi and Polly, oh my God, like your strength. To be here today, that was really hard to hear, but I think it's really important to hear that. You're also an inspiration for being so strong with action, so it's just great to have a talk about this, talk about the music and hearing those stories, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a five-month-old. I have a 16-year-old stepkid. Um, I get it. Like, this is scary stuff, um, and we're taking it very seriously. Um, Terrapin actually um, started with um, with ro rolling out a responsibility campaign. We've actually been working on cannabis, doing good a little bit on it. Um, responsibility in several different facets of cannabis consumption, everything from driving, what we're talking about here today, but to consumption and potency and responsibility all around. In some ways, we're not reinventing the wheel. Alcohol industry has done this for many years, drink responsibly, all of that. I think the difference here is we need to tap into the cannabis community about this. This is not you know, the same person that's going out and buying a bunch of booze. This is a very you know, individualistic consumer. Um, we did some focus group testing around this, around people who identify as um, cannabis drivers, as in they have no problem saying that they drive on, you know, while using cannabis. And what was interesting is to hear from them, it, you know, yes, of course, planning ahead and all of that is a very important message that resonates, and that's why we're here today. But also this concept of shared responsibility and kindness that Skylar was talking about, it's a selfish choice mm -hmm. to choose to get behind the wheel when you're impaired. And so talking to them in the sense that what we've always been known as as cannabis consumers is <coughs> kindness, compassion, empathy. Um, it's what Cannabis Doing Good does so well is tapping into the good of the cannabis community. And when you talk to the cannabis consumer about that shared responsibility, about being empathetic to the loss, about being responsible and kind to your neighbors and not getting behind the wheel in those situations, and of course the plan ahead, um, we think we'll have some success. So we're gonna start to explore with some of that um, responsibility messaging, putting some different campaigns together, websites, things like that, more to come, but um, it's, it's an important discussion we need to have. And Courtney, with um, Cannabis Doing Good, you've worked with Terrapin, you worked with others. Anything you kind of want to share on this point? Yeah, I think I have worked with most businesses here. Um, so yeah, similar sentiments as Peter, Polly and Naomi, thank you for being here. Um, also have very small children and lots of children tangentially that I love and care for. Um, so it's important to hear your story and I cried deeply um, listening to both of you. So thank you for bringing me. 
Um, I think that from our perspective, the cannabis industry emerged from a group of people who uh, wanted to provide plant medicine and access to plant medicine to their family members, to their neighbors, even to their children. Um, this industry was birthed from a really good place. It's become a massive industry and we have a huge responsibility to ensure that all of our messaging continues to be about people, continues to be about community and neighbors and our children and our family. Um, and so from Cannabis Doing Good's perspective, everything that we do with many of the brands and businesses in this room is to really understand that our business is built on purpose. That purpose is caring for people, caring for environment, and caring for racial equity. In this particular message, what we always say is that when you're talking about cannabis, the messaging should never be about the product. It shouldn't be about the price. It shouldn't be about potency. It should be about purpose. Um, and so I'm really proud to be in a room full of cannabis businesses who say that today their purpose is to reduce impaired <coughs> driving. Um, and I think it's something that we should be on top of, we should be ahead of, and that we should leverage our privilege as a very visible industry on a very visible holiday um, to, to talk about this message. So um, but I'm honored to be here, and I believe deeply that this industry is doing the right thing. Carla, you're with Wana Brand, which is an edibles brand in Colorado um, and across the United States um, in Canada. Um, you're the CSR director, and um, you've worked a lot on the education. Do you want to just talk a little bit about um, what Juana's philosophies are? Yeah. First off, I, I don't know if I'll be able to be as eloquent as Peter and Courtney <laughs> and Liz, but I'll do my best. Um, first and foremost, again, thank you both for inviting us into your children's lives. Um, and Holly, I was really struck by Ethan's mission, um, and that's why we're here today is to unite and share our wisdom and um, you know, to, to be constructively work towards finding some solutions to these problems. Um, and um, I also, Naomi, wanted to say it's okay to not be okay when we're talking about it because this is not okay. <laughs> and that's why we're here today. Um, you know, really getting, we, we, I keep hearing the word choice and, and, and it is a choice. It's, it's poor decision making, and we need to do our part to have educational resources, not only for consumers, but for the dispensary teams that are, that are selling our products, so that people can use responsibly, especially with edibles, it's so important to, to start you know, low and go slow with it. Um, it can be very, um, very personal for people what works for them with these products. It's, it's not turnkey, and they really need to be working with the guidance of dispensary teams, of groups such as LEAF 411, to ensure that they're um, responsibly using the product. Um, but also, as we've all touched on, if you're planning to consume, you can take time to plan for, for your transportation, or if you even need transportation, you know, you can stay home. You can find a, a sober driver to be a part of, of your evening with you. We're very lucky to live in the world of ride shares. You know, utilize those resources. And so, um, you know, having having educational resources on our website for consumers, but also building educational resources for dispensaries, so that we're all in line and aware of you know the potential impact we have is, is paramount. And again, I just really appreciate everyone coming together today because. Um, you know, we, we have to be unified in order in order to make uh, a true difference in, in, and prevent what truly is by name a preventable tragedy from happening. Can I add to what Carla yes, said? Yes, please. Okay. One of the things um, that, I, that I think is important to share is, you know, a few years ago when my daughter was just born, I went to speak at a conference uh, in Boulder about purpose-driven cannabis. There were products available, there were edibles. I was like, ah, it usually takes about 30 minutes. I'll take it. It'll hit me right when I get home, and I'll go right to sleep. It hit me about 10 minutes into my drive, and I knew I had made a huge mistake. I wasn't driving. I had someone else driving. Um, but I knew I had made a huge mistake. She was driving me to my car in Denver. So I was like, I've got to call my husband and tell him what am I going to do and stay on the phone with him while I drive and had a really long process. And I share this uh, not to throw myself under the bus because I am human and I made a mistake but to share that, to Carla's point, when you're consuming cannabis of any form, the amount of lipids, fats, things in your body, 
the type of cannabis used in that particular product, the dose in that product, those things are highly unpredictable. I've been in the cannabis industry 10 years, 10 years. I thought I had it down. It's like, I'm gonna take this edible and it's gonna kick in in 30 minutes, I'll be perfectly home in bed. And that just did not happen. Um, and again, I've been, I've been a cannabis user my entire life and it's not predictable. It doesn't mean that the products and the businesses aren't dosed, aren't tested, and aren't safe. It means that the individual's personal reaction to that cannabis is always going to be variable. Mm -hmm. And so I do think it's really, I think your message is really important about going slow. Um, and I also think it's important to know that in any given moment, depending on what you had for lunch or what you didn't have for lunch, is going to impact how cannabis feels in your body. Um, thank you for that. Oh, I'm Actually, some stuff that the state even does around this. CDPHG actually has some language around start low, start low. go slow, um, which our bud tenders are actually trained on. But beyond that, we actually go beyond internal trainings around how to spot intoxication, how to talk to um, consumers about it. I think what I was talking about with putting together this overall responsibility campaign is driving is actually really just one component of it, and the industry does need to rally behind stuff like this because it is the potency um, of the individual user. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, um, what you ate today, what's going on metabolism wise and all of that. So I think some full education around consumption, around, you know, different methods of consumption, that kind of stuff um, will go a long way to also educating on the driving side of things. And there's a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, Fran, if you can kind of touch on Mad's philosophy around, you know, consumption and driving, and also I want to go into like the science of of understanding how someone or when someone is intoxicated and where we're at with that, and hope you, I can pull in um, CDOT and uh, Sergeant Ma on that. But um. sure. So yeah, we started in 1980 you know, working on drunk driving. And our, our message was always, you need to plan ahead. So if you're, don't drink and drive is what we, we said before. Now we say plan ahead because we want to put it positively and we want to emphasize the action that people can take. Um, but it was always, you know, we want to separate drinking and driving. That's the safest choice. Um, and so uh, when uh, recreational cannabis became legal here, um, we know that cannabis and alcohol are very different drugs. They work differently. There's some things in our laws that are different as well. Uh, and it can get really complicated, and we thought, well, let's just keep it simple. If you're gonna be consuming cannabis, plan ahead for a safe ride home uh, before, before you're consuming. Um, and so, you know, there are ways where this gets super complicated, and we also always want people to know that that, that simple action, planning ahead, uh, really does help save lives and prevent injuries. So uh, that's the message that, that we wanna get out and how we try and approach um, talking to people about There's some, you know, there's conversations around how do you tell that a person is intoxicated, and I know that there's some work going on in the legislature and I and you know different technologies. Um, could anyone kind of comment on what's like coming down the pipe? Sure, I'm Vaughn Davis with the Highway Safety Office. Um, it's not about intoxication; it's more impairment. You know, impairment is a lower degree, but the statute says if a person is impaired to the slightest degree, then they normally would be otherwise if they're driving. And I hear a lot of focus on nanograms and things of that nature. This paper flips a gram. A nanogram is a billionth of this. So if you look at five nanograms, a person would be have a reasonable inference they're impaired. They're a billionth less than one. It's not about nanograms to see that. It's about impairment. It's about the officers and Nobody is stopped for DUI, they're stopped for a traffic offense. And it's during that personal contact what the officer sees that leads them to do more investigation. The person doesn't know what nanogram level they are. The officer doesn't know, and you won't know for like probably 14 days you get a blood test. It's a 
about being able to detect the impairment. The nanogram will confirm it level, but only by the state definition where it doesn't have a lot of science. So to me, it's old time law enforcement. Can you detect impairment? Can you articulate it? And can you process the person to get what you need? And please remember too that our arrestee in the state has a lot of input about how they're gonna be tested. They can refuse, which a significant group does. If they have alcohol on board and the officer does not detect the uh, anything else, they may simply be, just be tested for alcohol. They're off the road, but that doesn't address everything that's in that person's system. DUI arrest investigation is a complex investigation, and your evidence is your person, not their blood. Yes, and uh, the, um, uh, I called with the uh, Sergeant Mott with the Denver Police Department, I call, uh, uh, with, with Lynn, has just said, the statute of DUI definition of driving under the influence is when the person has consumed substance, not when the person is uh, drunk or high on the substance. The person consuming the substance affect the person's ability to drive to the slightest that could be. And when an officer is coming in contact with a person, um, before that contact happens, uh, officers uh, make their own observation of the person's driving, and then during the personal contact and to uh, uh, observe other signs of uh, Especially trained police officers um, here in Colorado. Right now, that we have a, a drug recognition expert school uh, that is uh, uh, going on down at uh, Castle Rock, and they will be graduating on Thursday. And uh, we'll be a new group of uh, DREs joining the uh, impaired driving enforcement effort. And uh, these officers not only can detect and observe um, the uh, general driving violations, but also the clinical and the physical signs of an intoxication with the impairment of a driver, and it, which will assist uh, them to determine whether um, the person should be charged with uh, the offense of driving under the influence. I would just say that I think that the alcohol industry historically has done the cannabis industry a disservice on this because alcohol kind of stresses, well, you can kind of have one drink. You can kind of have two drinks. Maybe you can safely drive. That's kind of how we set the legal limit with, with interest in the alcohol industry. The fact is you, you really shouldn't have one drink and drive. You should not have an edible. These are the exact responsible thing, right? But, but the culture of consumption generally has said, oh, no, no, there's a line where it's okay, and then we don't talk about it if you're stuck with that line. And, and increasingly the data is clear. There's, there's really no way to consume. These are, should be totally separate. It is it's never okay. If you're going to consume anything, don't drive. It is so easy not to do that, right? And if you're going to drive, don't consume anything, and there's no gray area. And that's kind of, that's the direction we're trying to move in at AAA is, let's rethink our history on this, because there's not the, the two drink, okay drug. There's not the single hit, okay drug. There's, there's, there's never an excuse. It is heavy machinery, right? Right. Um, you know, so with the te technologies on the horizon, anything you guys want to add about, you know, any legislation that's coming down the pike or um, anything along those lines? Um, yeah, I mean, so first of all, it's really helpful and encouraging to hear law enforcement and transportation talk about the cognitive nature of impairment, and I think that's where we have to head on the legislative level. Level There is House Bill 1321 uh, would create funding for a study of devices that would be able to measure the cognitive impairment involved in cannabis, um, and it was also encouraging to hear you talk about the rule, uh, when the legislature was passing the five nanogram li limit, once upon a time I was a reporter and I had to cover that committee hearing and what was it stood out to me was we were legislating in a vacuum. They pointed to one study in Amsterdam at the time that um, wasn't really well you know, vetted, wasn't robust enough, um, and we kind of picked a number. So now where we have to head is how are we actually determining you know, intoxication from a cognitive standpoint as it relates to cannabis? And I think having funding for studies for technology that would allow for such a thing is probably the future of where this goes. And CDOT's like the way on that too. 
Bo Davis uh, Highway Safety Office. Uh, CDOT supports House Bill 1321. Um, that would be a study to look at devices that measure cognitive impairment. Not a device to be used at roadside, and you can't use a device at roadside in this state. And I really almost don't want to go that route because it's not about a device, and it's not about a nanogram level, it's about detecting impairment. And I don't want to see people being arrested on a device because then the whole issue is about how the device works. It, it's, a, it's about that type of impairment. Um, it is difficult to come up with uh, studies for cannabis because it's a schedule one. And a lot of people can't be tested, but the, the new, the house infrastructure bill or the president's infrastructure bill is probably gonna have things in it that is gonna make it easier to test people on cannabis. And if that happens, I'd really like to see it come from Colorado where, where this began and let's get a true number if there is a true number. But I, I just think the cannabis consuming public and the roadway users deserve something better than a number that came out of a special session in haste. Well, you know, you talk about Colorado being a leader and actually this is such a unique partnership between industry and, and you know, nonprofits and government and agencies. I mean, have you seen anything like this before? Is this kind of a first of its kind, Fran? Um, can you speak on me a little bit? Sure, uh, Fran Lanzer with Mad Colorado. Um, well, I think CDOT has done some really tremendous work in engaging the industry for a number of years. I think for, for us, this is unique, bringing in uh, victim survivors into that, that mix, uh, to work with our traffic safety partners and to work with our partners in the cannabis industry to try and find the solutions. Uh, so for, for me, this feels very different. I also wanna recognize there's been some really great work going on. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, every day I feel like kind of have, you know, horrible tragedies, and then we also do have hope. And so knowing that um, there are technologies evolving, that there is a lot of research being done, and I think we need to stay nimble and agile so we can find good solutions that way, uh, and also to see us coming together and, and looking for solutions together, uh, something that gives me hope, and I'm really thankful for. Liz, is this, you know, what got you into this, you know, partnership and, um, was it a tough decision? You know, within the cannabis industry, uh, our social responsibility is incredibly important. We have um, a big spotlight on us, especially in Colorado, so we wanna make sure that we're doing everything right um, at, you know, as much as we possibly can. Um, this partnership um, act with Matt actually started before I worked for Native Roots. Um, and I found it incredibly important that we continue this partnership and build off of it because we're reaching very different uh, populations. And by partnering together, we can cross those populations and reach more people um, with a trusted voice and a trusted message that we're sharing together. Anything, um, you know, talking about CSR and reaching out and, and reaching to community, anything you guys would like to add on that? Carla Rodriguez with Wanna Brand. The only thing I wanna add, I keep coming back to what Skylar was saying, and I appreciate, while I appreciate the conversation about legislation and technology, at the end of the day, where we are right now is just responsible consumption, and what's gonna help people, what is it, next week? Yeah. You know, and you know, Naomi, you brought it up. You know, what are we, what are we saying to folks when they're purchasing? <laughs> What are we, how are we reminding them to be responsible? And I love that, you know, Native Roots and Harrison have plans in place. And, you know, to the average person, to the lay person, it's just important to have a clear message on prevention, which is don't consume if you're driving. If you're driving, don't consume. <laughs> yeah, and I think the cannabis industry is so um, unique in the sense, so like Wana is the perfect example, right? Like Wana makes edibles. They don't, you don't have stores. You know, right. and so they have to work with stores to get that information out. It's not like, and you don't see this in the liquor industry for the most part, where mm -hmm. like, you know, the beer distributor doesn't drop off the beer at the liquor store and be like, hey guys, we have to have a really serious conversation about driving intoxicated. No, they're just <laughs> dropping off the beer and they're leaving. But the fact that we're having conversations with third party producers who are selling in our stores and all of that, 
it shows that there is this level of engagement that is unique. I, I mean, obviously, you know, I have a bias working in the industry, but I think it is unique to what we've seen before. I think we've probably learned a lot of lessons from the past when it comes to alcohol. It took ages for them to really come around and start to do things like this. Um, so we're trying to get ahead of it. And I think that's exactly what Carl was talking about. Just kind of like, um, funding time to take office. Fran said the state, I'm going to take her beer, so I have to go. Um, <laughs> I really enjoy these uh, these partnerships, and I think they're nurtured not just by the state and MAD, and it's the industry to everybody together. The state statute mandates that the industry work with health and other state agencies of the Merit Warrant Education Oversight Committee. So that's a mandated group. But there's also the state UI task force, and uh, people on the task force have to be appointed, and they also have to be, that, is, that requires statute change. The task force has two people from the cannabis industry on it, one that does the industry, and one that represents people in sales. And I cannot find record of any other state doing that until ours did. And that's because the task force wanted that. Mm -hmm. We want to be part of this community. I don't know this language. I don't know how to reach. So we've done that together. And, and as far as CDOT too, CDOT gets a certain amount of money from the state to advertise and make for cannabis awareness because if we use our federal money, we're really limited in our message. And we don't want the federal involvement in our cannabis message. Um, I think it's just the right thing to do for these partnerships. And I think it's really been beneficial for everybody that's been in it and just the conversations we've had that we, we, don't, we don't work and live in a vacuum. I remember back then Madkin had their logo on, on certain things. You know, I mean, look, look at how much has changed and, and good, good for Mad Colorado Mad and Ashley for doing this. But um, I think the more dialogue they have, the more understanding we'll have and the more we can uh, reach our customer. And I agree with you, Peter. We're trying to create a culture before it develops. Alcohol back in the day, back in the day, was almost 60% of fatalities are COVID. That's crazy. Now it's at 30. We want to kind of start with the cannabis industry and the consumers so it doesn't go that way. And it, 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 But it's a different culture we're developing. So, but you can just see, I mean, there's a real tie in the state has with you. And you've been just, uh, did someone have a question? Oh, I was going to say something. Yes, please, no. Okay. Uh, Courtney with Cannabis Steering Guide. I just want to comment that I think that there's some interesting things to consider when we think about all the people in this room. The alcohol industry has multiple large national associations that dictate how it talks about itself, what kind of marketing campaigns it does, how it holds brands accountable, how it holds retailers accountable, right? And it took a long time for that association developed and alcohol industries now and businesses can still opt in to participate. But what we're seeing here is individual businesses come forward without any mandate from policy, without any mandate from some association that's gonna hold them accountable you have individual businesses who are coming together saying, like, we understand we have a responsibility here. Let's build that message and that narrative together. Policy is necessary, it will never be sufficient. And so we must rely on private industry to talk directly with their consumers to build a culture of care and responsibility that we see. And so I think that it's always meaningful to talk about what technologies are available and what legislation is gonna be passed and what's happening at the state level. But we can use racial equity, we can look at sustainability, we can even look at CSR. Policy never does the job at enforcing the change that we actually see. It's just not sufficient. So I think this is a really great recognition to say, we're not gonna wait on legislation, we're not gonna wait on some industry trade group to mandate it. We're actually gonna show up at the table now and start building out a message of responsibility and community care that we can uphold, that we can keep each other accountable because that's where power lives. Right, consumers and patients always have a choice. And actually, one thing that remains consistent always is that people have money to spend and their dollar has power. So if we can use the inverse of that power to talk with consumers and talk with patients and say, you're coming into our store, you're purchasing our product, here is what we expect of you. To be part of the cannabis industry is more than consuming, it's more than going to the Grateful Dead concerts, it's more than going and celebrating 420 out in the park. It's about accessing medicine responsibly and holding each other in a, in a space of care and responsibility. And I, I think that's really important to recognize about what's happening today. Absolutely. You know, you've talked a little bit, Glenn, about the, the public service campaigns that you've done on this. And um, 
can you talk a little bit about you know that history and um, anything else that anyone else would want to add just about the history of, of the partnerships and the programs and what you're seeing? And sure. Uh, Glenn Davis, Highway Safety Office. And they're not the ones I've done. They're the one my office has done. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, <clears throat> but when we, we first started, we had impaired driving awareness canvas ads 90 days after sales. That, that was really pretty, pretty rapid. And I thought they were just state of the art. And the consumers thought they were kind of crude. And looking back now, they were. But what we did was start you know, engaging our consumer audience our sales audience, so how do we reach that? Because reaching a cannabis consumer is different than a lot of different types of consumers, so we really refine that. And then uh, one year we used money to uh, work with the cannabis community. We interviewed about 20, I think about 29,000 people or some significant number of the cannabis conversation. How do we reach you? What's the best way? And we found it's not being, it's being important. Facts, not funny, no stereotypes. So I think we've really grown that way, and uh, we continue to take a look at it every year to reach that group. And again, we're not restricted by the federal funding we have, um, and we will bring that group in every year. Uh, in fact, we're presenting to the, the marijuana industry group just on data in the next few days. But it, it's a developing uh, situation. There was no commercials about impaired driving cannabis prior, so there's none. So what we had is what we had, and I think they've really grown, and they've gone from more of a joke to more like responsibility and addressing that consumer's needs. Anything you want to add about future plans or? Um, I, <laughs> the, no, that's okay. The, uh, <laughs> the, the genius is over here, but I, I just know that we're always working on, uh, they're always working on new things, ways to reach people. We are gonna have a presence at, at 420 this year because again, we need to re get that consumer and we found that the best place to reach consumers point of sale or point of use and also to the bud tender community. I've been to bud tender class four times just because I want to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And if that's the audience we need, I always learn something in there. So we're never going to stop trying to make our message the most effective it can be. I would just say, and I would be remiss if I didn't say this, and it's always ironic when the person representing motorists says this, we're all against impaired driving, right? That's why we're here. That secondary part, driving, if we're going to be against impaired driving, we need to rethink our infrastructure, right? If you get drunk or high in Denver, it is hostile if you're a pedestrian, it is hostile if you're bicyclists, because we have built our entire society, we've built how we ship goods and services around the car. If, if we want to get serious about solving this, it means whole system safety. It means that we consider, of course, what can we do to make transit appealing to people who are going to get drunk and high, because they are going to get drunk and high, right? What can we do to make it safe for you to walk home from your friend's house, or walk home from the bar, Right now we take the car as this given in American society, the car is very dangerous. Uh, how do we reduce car trips? Because in, by doing that, we'll also reduce impaired vehicle users. Anyone want, we're coming up on the end of our time. I don't know if there's any questions we wanna take, but um, anything, any final words in, uh, or, or comments before I kind of turn it back to, to Fran and, and Holly for, I was just going to say thank you to everyone, especially you guys that are here to try to make a difference or save lives. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca, were there any questions? Uh, mostly just challenges with sound, but I do think um, something that came up a, a little bit is um, you know, a general concern around a little bit of what Peter was speaking to around um, THC potency and um, what what's being done. And I think you kind of already answered that question in terms of like at least acknowledging that, that yeah, there's a wide I mean, variety there. I, I can elaborate a little. I mean, we're here today to talk about preventing crashes, obviously, from um, those who are driving still. I think it's impossible to have that conversation without talking about potency. Right. I think what the industry has always been saying as it relates to potency is that this has to come down to education and responsibility. Mm -hmm. You can't legislate this away. You can't create any policies 
There's nothing that can be done when it comes to potency other than explaining to people what it means, what it means to you, how to go slow, how to be responsible with it, and change thinking and habits around that. So, I mean, that's why I brought it up, um, is because it is interconnected, but there is a solution, and it's us as an industry embracing the education and responsibility around that. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Yes, Scott. Uh, seem proactive rather than reactive, always. Mm -hmm. There is one more question so far. How many hours should the user plan on after last use before getting behind the wheel of a car? And I think this is a tricky answer. So who would like to <laughs> take it? <laughs> Sorry, my, uh, the uh, LMO with the Denver Police Department. So uh, the research had, as far as uh, uh, cannabis use or any um, the illegal drug use, uh, it really depends on, uh, Courtney said, the individual tolerance and also dosage, concentration of drugs, and the how much uh, the uh, um, how long the person has used the drug. Um, the uh, the research thus far showed that uh, um, six hours after uh, initial use, the person will return to uh, some uh, the uh, state of normality. But it doesn't mean that the person is still not impaired to drive. Uh, with a uh, case that I have personally been involved in, which was a fatal, violent, fatal crash. The person, um, the was driving under the influence of cannabis at a 134 miles per hour in a post at a 35 mile speed zone and instantly killed the victim. And uh, five hours later, um, this driver still showed uh, noticeable uh, signs of impairment and uh, his, uh, THC level was two nanograms. Hmm. So, um, with that being said, um, the uh, how many hours after a usage to drive? This is a very difficult uh, question to answer. And uh, our message is: uh, uh, be responsible to yourself and be responsible to your loved ones. Um, find a ride share. Find a sober friend uh, who can drive you. Utilize alternative uh, method to uh, get yourself home safely. So. And I think just to, to jump on that, relative to users of licit or illicit substances, there's a belief that you might be able to correct course. I've had too much of substance A, I'm going to apply substance B, therefore I'm safe to drive. We've seen from the CDOT and state control and impairment and fatality data, that is not the case. There is no way except the passage of time to make yourself sober. And, and one way to make yourself less sober is to be tolerant impaired. So that there's just never any reason, and the science is clear, it doesn't work. So we do have one additional question. Um, following on Mr. McKinley's comments, what will the cannabis industry do specifically to support and make possible non-automotive travel among cannabis users? Is that like in the form of discounts or, or promotions and just base? Yeah. Is that what you're hearing? I'm taking notes. I um, mean, we would love to work with AAA on some sort of programs to, and I believe that part of this campaign is obviously talking Lyft and Uber and encouraging people to take all that. In the past, there have been partnerships around discounts. Mm -hmm. um, we can always explore things like that, and you know, AAA would be a great resource to potentially partner with vendors for discount in-store activations and discounts to encourage other modes of transportation other than driving. That being said, I think the cannabis industry has to just be good corporate st stewards and citizens and be encouraging sustainable transit and you know all sorts of different alternatives having retail shops. So I think it's a, more of a holistic answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you guys have done, there has been some, re I've seen some retailers certainly do you know, 10% off of Lyft or Uber you know, with this discount code. There's been partnerships in the past. Yeah. It's hard to know how, how effective those are, um, but they're, they've happened and are my, happening. My husband and I were brainstorming some ideas last night and we were wondering if something like, uh, you know, some kind of a, a coupon insert with the purchase saying, if, if you prove to me that you used alternative transportation like your Uber receipts, you know, um, show that and we'll give you 10% off your next purchase or something like that. Um, you know, where it's a very specific thing and it's holiday. Yeah, absolutely. You know, do that and we'll do, we'll do this for you. 
And it doesn't have to be related just to 420, you know? There's exactly. lots of holidays out there. So exactly, yeah. yes. Lots of them. And Tuesdays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Tuesdays. <laughs> that was just Tuesday, too. <laughs> um, we are coming up on the end of time, and I think we are going to close. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say one more thing. Instead of like your point system you get, so you didn't do get more marijuana, they could use that point system to use their Uber ride. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of different ways. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Paul, go ahead. Second. Um, so are we closing up now? Yes. Uh, so thank you guys so much for your time. It's an important conversation. It's a difficult conversation, but we will continue the conversation throughout this year, next year, and beyond. But I do want to close um, with um, some words from Holly. Thank you. Um, uh, my son, as I mentioned, uh, he was a journalist, and um, journalists chronicle our everyday lives. They reveal truths that the public deserves to know so that we can learn from our mistakes and improve upon them. Um, a 2018 Facebook post, he wrote, pray every day for a better world. The world needs your thoughts of love and hope. If you do nothing else, spare a fleeting moment of compassion for all the people suffering. A better world is possible through Jesus. And an excerpt from his last blog post, um, December 18th, 29, 2018, entitled The Reason You Were Born. Even the most absurd, cruel, and vile experiences happen for a reason. Every challenge of your life exists to get you to become a more peaceful, loving, and free human being. Your truest nature, your essence, your core is love. You are the energy of love expressing itself in this particular form today. Find that love, feel that love, cherish that love, embody that love. Stop pulling the blankets of comfort over your head every time life gets hard. Live your life fully and completely. It's the reason you were born. Paul, you can take some more. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm hoping the safest of 420s for everyone.